Check one, two. Okay. Um, sorry. I play in a band too, so that's what you're supposed to say as soon as you hit the microphone. Okay. Um, you guys saw this um, yesterday. I thought for just one second to do a couple of fun things. Um, first, although Narav refuses to take credit, um, he's been working with the Cyberduck people, so now iRods is integrated into the Cyberduck tool. So I know that, and somebody get Cesar away from the light switch too. <laughs> I gotcha. So one is full light, two is what you want to present. I got two. Okay, so anyways, here we go. This is uh, the Cyberduck. This is still a snapshot build. I, I don't know if they've hit the full release yet, but um, I can start up Cyber Cyberduck, and now you can configure iRod's grids in Cyberduck. So this is a local VM that I'm running here on my own computer. Um, let's see. Well, that's great. I see. I do have to log in. We do have security. Um, anyway, so so boom, this is a Cyberduck. Um, I'm looking at an iRods 4.1 server running on, on a VM on my machine. Oh, it's a 403 server. Um, upload, download, add collections, you know, the normal sort of operations you do in any kind of file browser. So just know that Cyberduck now supports iRods natively. This is going through jargon, direct port 1247 to iRods. So if you have Cyberduck users, you're set. The other uh, quick pet trick I was going to do was this is OneDrive. So I'm going to connect um, and, and mount a drive. I've already got one mounted. Let me unmount it and I'll mount it again. So you can. Just, so I've got a, a drive here that's set up to um, the same Tomcat server running, uh, or excuse me, the same uh, Tomcat server running WebDAV in the Renzi lab against that grid we were looking at with the web interface earlier. So I'll save this and then I will um, select it and mount it. There we go. So now here we are on my Mac Native Explorer up there. Pardon me, and I saw I've mounted WebDAV on my local Mac. You can do it in your Mac uh, or your uh, Windows Explorer. Um, so now iRods is there in WebDAV. Um, and the other quick pet trick is here's the REST API. Um, so here I'm looking at, um, so this, this is REST. It is JAX RS compliant. It's done using JBoss, REST Easy. It supports here, we're looking at XML. In this case, what I'm doing, if you look at the URL, is I am, I've got a collection resource, and then the, the rest of it is the absolute path in iRods. And then I've got some little uh, bits to twiddle there at the end. So here I'm asking for application XML, and I want a listing with the data. Um, just a quick pet trick. I can change this now to say I want JSON instead. And there you go. So um, anyway, so we have uh, a, a real REST interface. We're going to be, this is going to be very formally defined. It's going to move, move more slowly. So we're going to follow REST. Uh, um, and we're going to, like I said, begin plugging in new functionality. But all the basics are already there. So now onto the presentation. And kind of the point here is that some of the work that DFC is doing is building cyber infrastructure. So iRods is a base platform upon which we can do federation of policy management, but it's also about building around iRods an ecosystem that you could call cyber infrastructure. Um, so it's hard enough to talk about iRods even working with iRods a lot because it's a Swiss Army knife. So in a way, this is a, a we can look at sort of a very broad use case for iRods. Um, so DFC's goal, and Regan can jump up and. <laughs> Bonk me over the head if I get any of this wrong. Um, our, our goal is it's an NSF grant to create national scale cyber in infrastructure to support collaborative research. OK. Now, this is, this is a, one of Dr. Moore's um, sort of concepts that sort of drives you know, intellectually what DFC is doing. And it's this concept that research data has a life cycle. And we can characterize the life cycle by 
the kinds of collections, the purpose of the collection, and the policies that um, are around each of these kinds of collections at each different phase in the life cycle. So we start with project collections, data coming off of sensors and so forth. We have, it's private with local policies. We can share it on a data grid and you can have policies for its distribution. Um, it's a data processing pipeline so you can analyze that data. So it, these things also start getting new kinds of metadata as they go up the chain here in terms of the kinds of analysis that's being done to create products and so forth. You can create a, di a digital library and publish it. And then you can preserve it as a reference collection and sustain it through federation. I really like this slot too because IRODS actually had it start at NARA. IRODS at its root had digital preservation, trusted preservation for the long term as part of its mission. And I think adding that concept of digital preservation over the long term to this idea of sustainable research collections is really powerful. And in some ways, um, IRODS has kind of gone away from that, but maybe these sorts of concepts are pulling us back more to that world of digital preservation. So Gannon has this idea of cyber infrastructure, and I've kind of augmented it. Um, so data search and discovery tools, all the talk about metadata and discovery um, that you've heard all week, which I think is one of the big buzzes, is, is key in his concept of cyber infrastructure. So Gannon says security, but we've sort of changed that to say it's about policy management. It's more than just tackles, right? Um, and so user private data storage is cyber infrastructure, which strikes me as kind of funny. Cyber infrastructure is really ubiquitous data access from private collections all the way to published reference collections. That's what cyber infrastructure is. Um, tools for designing con and conducting computational experiments. And again, I think iPlan is way ahead of everybody on recognizing this. But really, to be, call yourself cyber infrastructure, you need that. Data provenance tracking. So some of the things that Hal demonstrated and blew a lot of people's minds with this thing about the rule engine and auditing, I think that, that really plays into this idea. And then I've added some of the things I was showing earlier, ubiquitous access through frameworks, protocols, and human interfaces. So we're seeing a lot of that. And then, again, this nod to our rod's roots, trusted preservation and maintenance of the significant properties of data sets, including um, uh, things about computation, which become significant properties of your data. Um, um, over the long term, maintaining usability by the target community. Okay, so if we think of all those things, IRODs and the things we're building around IRODs sort of can be defined by these points. Okay, so within DFC, metadata and discovery is a really big deal. We worked a lot with the Metadata Research Center here at University of North Carolina, and they've helped inject a lot of metadata thinking in what we do. Data and computation, again, we're using iPlant as a sort of an example, and then ubiquitous access. So the first thing about you know, the, this concept of the data life cycle is it's really about collection formation, creating collections based on data coming from different places, maintaining the significant properties to, to maintain meaning. So if we think about metadata, we need to curate by humans or generate automatic metadata via policy and computation. Then we index and organize through projecting into various kinds of indexes and metadata catalog so that discovery can happen. That's the idea of the indexing framework. And then you can form new collections via metadata. So again, IROD's breaking that hierarchy and being able to create new collections orthogonal to that hierarchy by metadata relationships. So this is one of the things we're building. So simple idea, and you've seen it in places like some of the QT demos we've seen, uh, like the excellent QT demo um, earlier before launch where we talked about metadata schema. So we want to bake in this idea of metadata templates within IRODs. Add structure to AVUs, be able to group them, validate them, um, give them meanings, um, bind metadata to the structure. You can audit, aut to automate data entry for curation to create nicely formatted displays based on metadata and do declarative metadata extraction. And, and we want it to be simple and flexible. So, so these are some of the goals of metadata templates. 
<clears throat> so Rick Scarb has provided me these slides. So this is the idea of you have an abstract API and a reference implementation. In our reference implementation, we're storing metadata templates as JSON files in iRODs and decorating them with AVUs for discovery and binding. So the idea is a metadata template has, you know, name, UUID, and all kinds of stuff about the purpose. And then the, is it required or not? And then you can have elements. And the elements include descriptive information, information about the units, type, excuse me? Type information, validation information, and so forth. <laughs> um, so the point of metadata templates is really tied to the UI stuff we're doing. So the idea would be instead of showing people a bag of AVUs in an interface, you can show them data in a structured way and then give the option of editing that metadata. Um, and it's as simple as uh, taking the JSON. <laughs> Take, yeah. Taking the, uh, taking the JSON and create different kinds of user interfaces in different places to do human curation. Um, it also means that you can create master catalogs of elements and share those elements among metadata templates so you can do things like metadata crosswalks. It also means that instead of human curation, one of the things you can do is declare a metadata template as automatic and it can relate to the application by which the extraction will be done, and then do a mapping between the output parameters of that computation and the, um, basically the IRODs, the AVUs that hold that data. So the idea would be that you can put a metadata template, bind it to a collection, and then um, automatic processes will then start extracting metadata based on those bindings. So it's actually pretty simple, but pretty powerful. And then the idea is the metadata template can mediate between AVUs stored in IRODs and um, this, you know, bond, you can combine that back with these templates to create interfaces for viewing, for um, data entry, for driving automatic extraction of metadata, and also for server-side validation. Okay, the indexing framework. So now we have, um, things that can help us structure metadata in IRODs in, in a lightweight way and do human or automatic uh, generation. The indexing framework is a shift in emphasis. So IRODs sweet spot to me is the policy management aspect. So we want to manage the metadata, we want to preserve it, we want to make sure that metadata cannot be deleted, you know, these kinds of policy things. Um, but IRODs as a discovery tool is not really its strength. So would you rather use uh, GenQuery or would you rather use Sparkle, right? So instead of us trying to be your discovery environment, IRODs becomes the canonical source of metadata and data managed by policy. And then what we do instead is we provide the mechanisms by which you can plug in indexers. And the way this is being conceived and how is around too, and, um, to talk about this too, is the idea that your grid, all the indexes are ephemeral. Your grid holds the data and you can take different collections, point an index or add it of one type or another, and generate indexes as you wish and, and then delete them or if they get corrupted, you can just regenerate them. So IRODS is the store, it preserves and creates the metadata and then projects it out into different kinds of indexes all through a plug-in mechanism. That's what we're going for. Basic indexing topology, this is all based on the, eight, the asynchronous messaging idea. So IRODs can throw messages out to a topic or queue. And then we have a message bus that defines regular interfaces so you can plug in indexers um, that can receive top, topic or queue messages and then do indexing activities for near real-time indexing. And iPlant is already doing this in the iPlant way. So some of this is actually taking things that are already being done in production at scale and sort of doing more abstraction and baking it into the IRODs infrastructure. Okay, two indexer types. There's um, an event like adding an AVU. So we showed this with Hive where people can mark up IRODs with a SCOS vocabulary term. Stored as an AVU triggers the indexing framework that can then maintain a Jenna triple store. So then you can do Sparkle queries against IRODs or the second type of indexer is one that has to index the file content. 
file format recognition would be an example. Um, extraction of a, of a sort of structured uh, file type or creating an inverted index using something like Elasticsearch. And so that kind of indexer actually has to get the file bits and stream them through some sort of algorithm to create the index. So we're kind of trying to handle both. Okay, so now you have an index sitting out there. Pardon me. How do you get it back? And so the idea is, we showed in the interface is virtual collections. The idea is that any kind of query that can generate an ILS type listing, no matter where it came from, um, can be brought back into IRODS as a virtual collection. So it could be SQL, Sparkle, some kind of Boolean or text search. Goes off, runs a driver, runs a query, comes back in and represents it as if it was a folder in IRODS. Pretty simple concept. Um, but I think it's really powerful because now you can form new collections. So start folders, really what that does is it just runs a gen query looking for folders with a certain AVU. You know, tags are the same thing. You could have a virtual collection which would be, you know, folders tagged with uh, some experiment number, you know, uh, using simple things that people understand. Um, but again, it breaks the IROTS hierarchy because that's like so 1990s to have hierarchical uh, representations of data, right? Um, I wanted to show this. I don't know if Brian is still here. We're shifting to applications now. So this is uh, some collaborative work that's been done between iPlant and Brian Blanton with his AdCert data. And so this is getting uh, ahead of where DFC is. What we're doing is we're working with iPlant to bring the discovery environment in as a generic white label infrastructure um, that you can run over the DFC grid. Um, so for example, on our DFC test grid, this is the iPlant discovery environment software running over the DFC test grid. Okay, and they're doing lots of work to pull the iPlantness out of it, as wonderful as iPlant is, so that we can uh, make it DFC. Um, <clears throat> and it's also really brilliant, I think, what they've done in the sense that, well, <laughs> What they've done here is, it's hard to see on the right, but it's like a virtual desktop for researchers. So you have data, you have apps, and you have analyses. So you can look at your data, find and do computation on that data, receive notifications, and, do, and, and handle the output of processes. So it's really about that workflow of data. And we're talking with them about trying to add a publish button here, too, where you could publish out to Fedora Commons or another IRODS grid or Data One so forth. Um, but anyways, the idea here that Brian nicely, um, you know, kindly su supplied me this slide is Brian is an oceanog oceanographer or an ocean, he studies wave, waves and, and uh, storm surge. That's what he's doing. Thank you. So AdCERC is a project here at Renzi and what he did is he worked with Nirav to get AdCERC, some AdCERC processing running on iPlant's environment. And the reason I'm showing this is one, this is really cool and I think this shows where we all want to go. And number two, I think it shows the broader applicability of what things are, of things that are happening in the community and how they really are cyber infrastructure for research as a whole. And so how can we sort of pick the best of these things and pull them together? I think this is what NS, uh, the DFC is about, right? So all credit to iPlant for doing this, but what it shows is, you know, here's a, an application which appears as a user interface to, to manage parameters. Um, he can select an application and run it. He can receive notifications about the status of that processing, and then he can handle looking at the uh, uh, output of those jobs, the analysis of those jobs. And so this gets me to this idea of, how, Brian said it did not take all that long. He said it took one hour. One hour? That's what he said. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, this, is, this was not something that was not something that DFC did. It's something, you know, along, all along the way, we, we've been working with iPlant to develop the software, but that's really something they did. And now we're trying to work to bring this in as a generic component as, of cyber infrastructure. But it's really exciting stuff. And, and what you know, I hope Narav won't like beat me over the head by saying, like, he's always saying the sweet spot is when you put computation next to this data. 
And I've heard this in a lot of places, and I think this is where this is going. So what we want to do is leverage this abstraction of an application, um, have a shared notification system within IROD so that applications can have a common way of notifying uh, people about events with their data, use the IROD's indexing framework for audit logs and provenance generation, thank you. Um, and um, the other thing here is that Regan and Raja talk about is reproducible science. If you have the applications, if you have the inputs and the parameters, not only do you preserve the data, and those parameters are metadata, significant properties about the uh, um, generation of the data and the data products, but you can actually rerun and reproduce those experiments. So reproducible science is a big thing. So far, I haven't gone so far off track, have I? It's all right. <laughs> OK. Um, and then we want to extend uh, clients through um, the configuration of applications. Again, the idea that can we, through adding policies and capabilities within the grid, have them surface in, interfa in interfaces without people having to go in and recode the work that Cesar is doing, for example, if that makes sense. So what we, all we're showing here is from the thing this morning is the way iPlant has computation. We similarly want to start looking at concepts where as you're looking at data on iRODs, it can present you with options that are based on the kind of data sort of intersecting with the policies that you have on a grid. And that can be something as simple as doing thumbnailing if it's an image. So different ways of doing applications. Some of these you know. Um, these are things that uh, people want to do. There's not a lot of time. These are short, these are short presentations, which you, know, you might enjoy not hearing me for more than 20 minutes. But um, there's too little time. There's a lot of web other interface work, a lot of API and framework integration. We've kind of hinted at some things. But the real, you know, I just want to say um, DFC is not the consortium. We work really closely with them. But there's a lot of exciting things that DICE is doing and DFC is doing that we're contributing and working with the consortium on. But we're, there's all kinds of exciting things happening in DFC. Um, now, Matthew, the other cool thing is, thank you, that Cesar and Matthew are relatively new. And I think a good sign is how they're good people, they're good developers, but how quickly they're able to get up to speed and start being productive as tools and things start building up around IRODs. Um, and so uh, to me, that, that speaks well. So I'm going to let him show some stuff here at the end. Introduce Matthew. You're a? I'm a, uh, hello, my name is Matthew Krauss. I'm a uh, sophomore computer science major at UNC. And I've been working uh, with the DICE group for as an intern for the past month, uh, building a um, native mobile app to work uh, alongside with the cloud browser that uh, Cesar and Mike have been building. So uh, when we decided that we wanted to have like a mobile app, um, we wanted to give like a user a Dropbox-like experience where they could upload, browse, download, and share files directly from their phone, um, whether it be photos, voice memos, what have you. Um, so here on like the uh, home page for data, you can see where you can download, share, um, and have a little bit of information about the files. We wanted to keep this um, pretty light. Uh, we have options like to go, like Cesar is working on a full, um, a full page that would provide more functionality. But within the native app, we wanted to keep it light and simple. Um, and we also decided within like the home page to have only your starred uh, files and collections appear rather than a list of everything you have. Um, and the one, one reason why we really wanted to have like a native mobile app was uh, to make it notification centric. So whenever um, someone shares something with you um, or if you're having a large process being worked on in the background and it gets completed, we want to send you a notification on your phone quickly and uh, just t to take full advantage of having a native mobile app. And uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, no, within the um, next, 
Oh, he was asking if this app is available now. Uh, within the next coming months, we're planning on publishing something on the uh, Google Play uh, market and Apple App Store. Um, but I do have a, a working prototype here if anyone afterwards would like to play around with it. Um, It, there, um, there's one called the DFC mobile browser. If you go to the, if you go to GitHub and just search for dice underscore UNC, mm -hmm. where jargon is, you'll find a GitHub project that's called DFC mobile browser. Um, the cool thing is, this really complements well what's going on the website because it's using the exact same back end. Since the back end is just REST, this is Cordova, so you can generate, you know, native Apple, native. Um, um, Android. Android, you know, you can access mm -hmm. the GPS and all these kinds of things. So we could do meta automatic metadata. But anyways, the, where, he, where he is now is he's got the running prototype and we just have to wire this into the back end. Because the really cool thing is we're doing the web browser with um, AngularJS and this is also using AngularJS. So it's really, it's really a very, just very little extra effort to get the mobile going. All right, thank you. Thank our speaker.